and drinking lemon water because of the state of my throat. That last one I got was extra strong just before I came up here. So if I look like I've been eating lemon, it's because I'm pretty close to have been. Now that can lead into a lesson, my second pronged lesson from this morning. Influence. That can lead into the lesson because that lemon <laughs> has influence on my taste buds. And you and me, every member of the church of our Lord is expected to have good influence, as the Bible defines that influence, over ourselves and over everybody we are around. One of the things that is a challenge to a gospel preacher and all that the New Testament defines gospel preacher to be, and now with me around 55 years of attempting to be one at various places on this earth, is how do you deal with people, members of the Lord's church, in their own personal growth and development in their knowledge and practice of the truth? Paul told Timothy to preach the word, be instant in season and out, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You suffer long with people. Well, what kind of gauge do you as a preacher use to gauge your suffering along with people? Well, the way that's worked for me is how much uh, do I want God to suffer with me? as I'm striving to live according to the will of God. I think that was one of the great big problems with the attitude of those known as Pharisees in Judaism. They were primarily uh, me, 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 according to our traditions to the point of setting aside the word of God that they have everybody do as they please. So we all are to influence others, and we are for good or bad. You never lose your influence. Somebody said, well, he lost his influence. No, no, you never lose your influence. Because you're either going to have good influence over people or bad influence. Influence is the power you have over others by the life you live. And that's going to be either good power or it's going to be bad power. It's the example, exemplary living. And the Bible had so much to say about that. So Jesus not only wants us, but he wants our influence. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Now I've got to ask me, what am I going to allow to influence me? Well, first of all, the Word of God. That's first and foremost and always. That teaches me how to live on this earth before anybody, anywhere, anytime. But then there's that influence that I have over others. Now, I can do that through what I actually teach as I'm striving to do now. And even James says, although we're trying to always find teachers of the truth, but even, I think it's interesting, James says, don't be many teachers. <coughs> Sometimes we think that, and in a sense it's true, every member of the church is a teacher. But obviously, James had in mind, some people should not be teachers. He says, we will receive the greater condemnation. But we all can be teachers in the sense we live our lives as the New Testament teaches before the world, before others. And we let the Word of God dwell richly in us. My influence then, of course we know it ought to be for good as the Bible defines that good. An old poem, and I, I don't know how old it is, says it. We are the only Bible's the careless world will read. We are the sinner's gospel. We are the scoffer's creed. Christ influences our lives through the Word of God, through His last will and testament, the perfect law of liberty. But also, we are influenced by our brothers and sisters in Christ to live in harmony with the truth. 
So these things I've said thus far, when you take into consideration the lesson of the morning in foul language and profanity, and there's one we didn't add to it because it just goes along with it. I didn't mention it. And that is simply pornographic stuff. I don't know uh, how you have pornographic things going on in this world as they are without profanity. And I don't know how you have profanity without pornography. But it's always been around. Our world becoming more secular, materialistic, and atheistic then glorifies in those things more and more. But we're still the church. I mentioned just a moment ago the long-suffering I have with others and I want others to have with me. None of it has to do with compromising the truth. Not a bit of it. But it means we recognize we're all at different degrees of growth and development. And we're all having to work with one another as human beings unless you've decided you're not a human being. And I don't think any of us have decided that. We all recognize, and we mention it in our public prayers, and I'm sure our private prayers, how much we need to grow and to develop in the grace and knowledge of God and in dealing one with another. Certainly the things we've been talking about this morning and then the influence we are to have as Christians should be pointing out to us the importance of a godly family and responsibilities of mama and daddy in rearing those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The training and teaching and example that needs to go on in those families, but it's not just a need, God commands it. It's not just what ought to be, it's what must be if heaven is to be our home. And in that way, the home being filled with Christians, that is, his mom and daddy, and the rearing of their children, then they cooperate with the church. And the church cooperates with the home without either one of them usurping the authority of the other or doing the work of the other. And that's very important to keep in mind. Another poem that points all of this out regarding your personal influence. You are writing a gospel a chapter each day by deeds that you do, by words that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? One thing that stands out in every family when the children come along is how much the children mimic themselves after their mother and daddy. It is hilarious sometimes, except there's such a serious side to it, to watch little children, especially, well, I sort of say especially, it's as much with the little girls, it is the little boys, when they start trying to wear their daddy's clothes or their daddy's work hat or uh, put the big shoes on, try to walk in their daddy's shoes, or, or the little girls trying to wear the hats their mama wore, or whatever it is that's peculiar to their mama and what she wears and what she does, and all of this kind of thing. Well, it is naturally built into them to do that. So what does that say about the influence of mother and daddy over their parents? Not only just sit, I mean, over their children, not only just sitting down and instructing them in the Bible, reading the Bible to them, talking to them on their own level of understanding, but just in going about your daily operation as a parent. I don't know of any young parents that as they look back, because they live long enough to grow older, and they look back on those days, they don't say, well, I wish I'd thought more about that then. That just didn't cross my mind. Or I wish I'd been more particular about that then. Uh, and it would have made maybe a difference. You can only go so far with that because Paul said concerning your past life, whether what you did was good or what you did was bad, forgetting those things which are behind, we're to press on to the mark of the high prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Those things are past. No matter how much good you did yesterday, that's over and done with. What are you doing today? And if you live, what will you do tomorrow, if tomorrow comes? It is a Christian duty to exercise good influence. And you can't do that if you don't know how the Bible says you ought to live. 
It is what we might call kingdom influence. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till it was all leavened. Matthew 13, 33. I've remarked about this at other times, but it's always amazing to me what profound truths our Lord teaches in such simple everyday things that people did and they were around all the time. So this parable in Matthew 13 relates to the powerful influence of the kingdom on the world. It is a penetrative force into people's minds who live and think as we discussed those worldly minds this morning and who live only on the level of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We can, by what we choose to do, the language we choose to use, the places we choose to go, the entertainment that we choose to enjoy, all of that says to the world who may not know much about the Bible, but they know you claim to be a Christian, this is how Christians do it. This is what Christians choose to do. Now, I recognize that you can, and I said it several times this morning, escape the world, you got to live in it. You know, the Bible is such, and the Christian who's truly converted to Jesus Christ is such, is that just anything that comes down the pike that's wicked, it doesn't bother us. The whole idea of evil companionship corrupts good morals is that you've gone overboard in your association with evil to the point to where you're involved with it and enjoying it, and it's going to rub off on you. It just is the way that the devil works. Jesus once said, Ye are the salt of the earth, Matthew 5 and verse 13. I think we know that salt has been used to the ages as an agent of influence. It's been used uh, to preserve meats. It still is. And so this metaphor teaches that Christ's disciples are to be agents of the influence of one living by the will of the Lord. In preserving the world. Maybe we don't think about that that much. Preserving the world from putrefaction, from corruption, from destruction. If we know our Old Testament, like I think I do to a point, and most of us do, then a lot of the things you read of in the Old Testament where God did not destroy something, it was because of the godly people still there. Remember when Abraham bargained with God about the destruction of Sodom? And he starts with 50 and says, if you find 50 there, will you destroy them? And he goes right on down. You couldn't even find 10 people in Sodom that were righteous. And that tells us something when God decides to destroy something. You can be sure God who's all wise knows there's no more hope. There's no more possibility that these people are going to be good. Time has run out on them. All they have coming for them is judgment because they simply haven't used the time they had to find God and live right. Now, I think that's when God's going to send his son back, but I don't know when that's going to be because the long suffering of God with mankind has always amazed me. There was not enough salt in the world in Noah's day, Genesis 6, 5 through 7. The world deserved to be destroyed. Neither, as I said, was there salt enough in the city of Sodom. Genesis 18, 20 through 33. That is to save them from destruction. Christ said, ye are the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14. Well, how does light influence darkness? It dispels it. The two cannot intermingle. Now, all through the New Testament, you have the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Somewhere or the other, the truth of God and the word of God is pictured as light. And darkness is pictured as those outside of the light of the truth. So we as the church, through the gospel, by preaching and defending it and by living it in everyday lives, are influencing people. Not only by the actual words that people must hear and understand as to how to be saved and when they're saved, 
but by the choices we make, where we go, what we do. Now, we can't get to the point in escaping the world that we do what some in what became the Catholic Church did, and it's still a part of them. And that is where you had the, the monasteries, the monastic life. Same thing's true of the convents. Where you had people trying to escape the world, so they took certain religious vows and orders, and they built a wall around them, and they got inside that wall to wall out the world. And so they could just be around people who totally, completely were dedicated to what they would say would be faithful service to Christ. The problem with that was they were in that wall. And when they were in that wall, the devil through them influenced them. You can't wall out the world in that way. You can't do it. It's a possibility. So you've got to have a faith built upon a thus saith the Lord proposition that allows you in the functioning out here in the devil's domain to be able not to allow those things to sway you. If your faith is not that strong, you will never make it. God intended that the army of the Lord with the items of armor that Paul lists in Ephesians 6, that when worn and used, you would be able to function out here in the world and resist the power of the devil. Resist the devil, and he'll do what? He'll flee from you. And then you're taught, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Well, how do you do both of those? Let's go with the draw nigh to God. You draw nigh to God by spending a whole lot of time studying his word, and a whole lot of time applying his word to your life. And then doing all you can to teach other people who are outside the gospel, the will of heaven, and encouraging your brethren to walk the straight and narrow way of divine truth. How do you flee from the devil? I just described one of them, just because you're drawing near to God. But otherwise, you fight the things of the devil. Just read your New Testament and see what the apostles and evangelists opposed. Look at the list of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. And you'll see what you are to put down in your life and to point out to other people that they live on that level and theirs they're not going to go to heaven it's a balance and yet in Christ what are we in I'm talking to my brethren now Christians all of us heard the same gospel we were all baptized to Christ our old sins were remitted the Lord added us to the church and so we stand before God as members of his church citizens of the kingdom of heaven what about our influence you know, here's one of the wonderful things about being a member of the church. You are in a state of grace. Now, the denominational people use that, and they don't understand it, because they think if you're saved by grace, there's no acts of any kind you need to do to participate in God saving you. That's just not true. The grace of God that bringeth salvation, Paul wrote to Titus, hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world. So this world's the place to prove to God you want to go to heaven. How do you do it? Just like Paul said to Titus. So what does that mean? Well, we're in this state of grace. Do you realize that means that as you strive to obey the truth, you make mistakes, you stumble, but you don't ever just stay down. You get up, you go on. Think about what have happened. Think about what would have happened if when Paul had to withstand Peter to the face, if Peter had just thrown him the towel. I've tried so hard, and now here again I've made a mess of it. But there was one there, like Paul, who said himself he was the chief of sinners. So he knew something about mercy. He knew something about grace. He said, I received mercy even though I did all these mean, terrible things to the church because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. He was favored of God. Every member of the church has been done a favor. You don't deserve it. God did you a favor. And when you accepted that favor by belief and obedience to the truth, you're in that favor and covered by the blood of Christ. Now here's my point. We need to deal with one another in that way. 
because that's the way we want God to deal with us in the same way. So in, as we live the Christian life, as we exert from our very examples influence for good as the word is practiced in our lives, then let us realize you're going to have people who stumble, people who sometimes turn out to be Ananias and Sapphira. They just plan on doing evil and they do evil and there wasn't any repentance on their part. On the other hand, you've got people like Simon, the former sorcerer, who sinned, but he didn't intend. He didn't know any better, and when he was sinned, he was rebuked severely and told to repent. And look at the attitude of the man. Oh, there's a difference. Attitude, state of mind. He said, oh, pray to God that none of these things happen to me. Two different views because of two different hearts. In the church, which are we? Let me ask you this. Would you like to be a member of the church at Corinth, as Paul described it in 1 Corinthians? Paul called them by the Holy Spirit as he addressed that letter, the church of God at Corinth. Sometime when you're reading through all that mess the brethren got themselves into there, remember, Paul by the Holy Spirit is writing part of the New Testament of Christ, and he addresses that church as the church of God at Corinth. Let's see, what about these people? Our brethren, they heard the same gospel we did, and they obeyed it, and the Lord added it into the church. I know they observed the Lord's Supper because they were making a mess out of it and had to be instructed in 1 Corinthians 11. They abused the miraculous gifts because they didn't love God like they ought to. They were all puffed up. And they even had somebody having his father's wife and they weren't even ashamed of it. They were sort of proud of it. And Paul says, well, that kind of fornication is not even named among the Gentiles. And they were in one of the worst cities in the Roman Empire for ungodliness and immorality. They had all of those things and much more. Division was rampant there. Would you become a member of that church? Or would you run as far as you could? Oh, and by the way, where would you run to? Would you run to be a member of the Galatian churches? And Paul, he called them old foolish Galatians. But they were the Lord's church. And Paul worked with them. Paul guided them. You see, you want that favor, don't you, from God in your life because you're not flawless that you want to extend to others. So when you think about the influence that you exert by what you do, and you think about foul language and immorality of everything, uh, of every description, there's something else that needs to be remembered. Things that have nothing to do with immorality or foul language or pornography. But just the things God expects the church to do to be the church. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. What is it? You know, James 1.27. To visit the widows and orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's pretty positive, isn't it? Got positive and negative. You're to do for orphans what their mom and daddy would do, but they're not there and they don't have a mom and daddy. Or for widows who should have a husband helping them to be what they need to have supplied to them or to be what they ought to be, but they don't have a husband. And it's not like our day and time. Rule that out of your mind. If you don't have a husband to help you, there's not anybody else unless family is there to help you. And in those days, there were a multiplicity of widows because men weren't doing well, very well at all, or they were doing well if they lived to be 40 years old. You see, we tend to see things back there like we see them today. You might be surprised that in the year 1900, the average lifespan of the American male was 49. So we cannot afford to look back at them and judge them in the light of what we are today in our culture and our society. We must understand the truth today of the gospel was for them just like the truth is for us today and it hasn't changed. But we must not read into them what we deal with today. The truth is there. The influence for good comes from our obedience to that truth. But then there's the working with one another. I don't see a lot of times, uh, I, well, I see a lot of folks saying, be patient with me. But I don't see some of those same people saying, let me be patient toward you. Are we choosing those things that will encourage us to be godly? 
Are we setting the example in recreation and all such things as that? That would say, this is what people who are of Christ choose. Because I can be involved in those things that corrupt my morality without even being personally involved with other people. It's just what I can watch on television or what I can watch at the movies. So I've got to be mindful of that. It's all around us. It permeates us. It's everywhere. I wish I could remember, and I can't call it to mind right now. What is it? Uh, TV Guardian. That's what I'm trying to think about. I'd recommend to anybody that you get one of those. Now, that helps blurt out all sorts of things that are ungodly and bad words and so forth. But be careful, brethren, lest you become a big old ante. That is, binding where God hasn't bound. And unless you say, well, the best thing to do is not have a television, because the best thing to do is not have a television, it works so well with me that nobody else ought to have a television. If they have a television, they're going to hell. Didn't take long to arrive at that, did it? Well, that may work well for you, and that's all good. And uh, I don't know a lot on television, even the news is worth watching. But you can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. And you know that saying's been around a long, long time, and it's for a reason. We have to learn to have the disciplined mind and view all things in the light of the truth and have these things and choose rightly and reject that which is wrong. When I was uh, been preaching about two years, the old gentleman who had been a member of the church for years that had contributed the land for the church building up on that Hickory Knoll above the lake. He's one of the old families of southern Arkansas. In fact, one time he showed me across that lake and said, the first, the first company of Confederates was raised right over there. That's how far back they went. Those things don't make any difference nowadays, but from folks in our history back in there, that was, that was looking at history over that hill. But he was so obstinate against radio. Now, mind you, this is about 1966, and he's against radio. Because radio has so many bad things on it. Now, think about that. 1966, bad things on radio. That he had resolved the gospel should not be preached on the radio because of the bad things on the radio. So what if I were to tell you today, you know how bad, how terrible, how wicked and vile things go on on the Internet. Wouldn't you agree? We don't want to preach the gospel over something like that. When you say there's something skewed, just like his thinking was skewed on using the radio to preach the gospel, because I tell you right now on the Internet, there's far more, there's far more going on that's vile and wicked like we talked about already on that Internet than it is on radio back in those days in particular. Don't throw the baby out the bathwater. The other thing is this. If as soon as you preach the gospel to people, they don't change immediately. Here's the thing you do. Never preach again. That's the thing you ought to do. Well, I told them. I told them the truth. And they didn't repent immediately. I'm never going to preach to them again. Now, uh, go to your New Testament and find where you have that authority to take that disposition of heart toward teaching. I just read to you, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, here's the part I want to add to it. And please be God as long suffering with me as I want to be toward others. When did you obey the gospel? How long did God wait on you to obey the gospel? Or maybe there are those who were, out, who were out of duty to God. They obeyed it a long time ago. I've been around a number of people like this. They were out of duty to God. And they went for years out of duty to God. And finally, they repented. They came back to their Lord and they faithfully served Him however long out they went. Why does God have not waited on you? It's true that we have to think personally. We may not live through the next minute. But when we're on this earth working to deliver the influence through the word and our conduct, then that's why it's our responsibility to live pure lives, set a good example, not compromise the truth we preach, 
and keep on teaching. If I had decided, or on the basis some have, not to preach because of opposition, I wouldn't have got through my first year. I'd quit a long time ago. And there's not any other preacher that's faithful in life and doctrine that would have either. But you know better. One of the things that's been impressed upon me all the way back to my youth before I ever preached by older preachers and by other members of the church who were faithful, if you choose to be a preacher of the gospel and all that the New Testament teaches, you live the righteous life and you preach that gospel in its fullness and you defend it. Let the chips fall where they may. Sow the seed of the kingdom. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Then in the divine organizational structure of the church, let the elders be the shepherds. Let the deacons be the servants of the shepherds and servants of the church. And follow that divine pattern for the organization of the church so that those in the grace of God may develop and grow. Because I want God to have mercy on me. I want God to bear with me. And I'm glad that he has. Now, all my life, I've done my best to preach the truth and live the truth. So you see, because I've done that, it must mean I'm flawless and I'm perfect. Well, I guarantee you, people are very ready to find up and say, Dave Brown's not perfect, Dave Brown's blah, 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 blah. Well, I know that better than they do. But I'm faithful. I know that because I can read my Bible. Question, are you? Because I know you're not perfect in the sense of flawless. I know you won't say you don't need the blood of Christ to continue to cleanse you, 1 John 1, 7. I know you will pray all the time that uh, we will grow and develop, and you pray for your brethren that you'll grow. Well, if, you, if you're growing and developing, does that mean you have not yet attained? Paul himself said, I have not yet attained, but this one thing I do. Now, if the Apostle Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians 13, who did so many things, it shows that he would not compromise the truth one little bit and would die for the Lord. If he could bear with people and declare he had not yet attained, is there a lesson in that for me as an individual Christian, as a man, as a father, and so on, preacher, elder, whatever? Well, if there's not, what are we doing here? Why do you study your Bible? So when you see people in the church doing things that aren't all they ought to be, does the Bible teach you what you ought to do about that? Or does it teach you just to say, well, I'm not going to mess with them anymore, which says your grace ran out before God's did. Your long-suffering quit before God did. Because you see, every member of the church ought to be a part of that long-suffering. doesn't mean you condone them. It doesn't mean you say, oh, they're right in what they're doing. Not at all. And I guess I can bring it down as we close with this matter of good influence. And don't be a stumbling block. That is, don't do things in living your life that causes somebody else to go out and sin. That's what a stumbling block scripturally is. But it comes down simply to how do I want God to deal with me? If I want God to bear with me, let me bear that way with others. And I have all sorts of this teaching in the New Testament show me how to do it. And then, uh, then you might be ready to go work with a church like Corinth. And be a member of that congregation. And work with those people. I'm going to tell you right now, I sure would hate to go work at the church of Corinth the way it was when Paul wrote that letter to them. You ever been a member of the church like that? I haven't. I've never seen, listen, my personal life. I don't know what other people have seen. I've never seen a church as bad as shaped church of Corinth. Never have. The other thing is, in my life, I have known the church at greater peace, even with all the problems that come up and down, greater peace than the Apostle Paul ever knew the church to be in. I haven't had ever to be concerned that I was going to be arrested for preaching as I'm preaching right now. Just read the book of Acts with the idea, would you be faithful? Would you be so bold? Might not be so upset with Demas who has forsaken me, Paul said, having loved this present world. If you're about to be pelted with rocks because you're coming in this door, because you're going to preach, 
then you might be a little squeamish too. So our influence, what kind of influence is it? What kind of power does my life have over others? Well, it's all going to have to be entwined in the favor we enjoy as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now do you understand why John, as he rebuked error and false teachers, why he said in 1 John, little children, love one another. He wasn't saying put up with error. He's saying people grow and develop. Deal with them like Peter did with Simon the sorcerer. Deal with them like Paul did with Peter himself. And above all, deal with them like the Lord did his own disciples. One minute he's blessing Peter. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That's on the basis of his confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Just a few verses later, he turns to Peter and says, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest the things of men and not those of God. Well, that's, all, <laughs> that's just almost bounce, bounce. Which way to go here? What's wrong with the Lord? Nothing wrong with the Lord. Nothing has ever been wrong with the Lord. The Lord knew exactly how to be long-suffering and extend His favor and not put up with any monkey business out of anybody. And He did it all the time. Just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if we as the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular can't do that kind of thing with us, ourselves, as we want God to do personally with me. I do. I want God's mercy. I want all the mercy I can get from God. And I know that means I've got to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as I know, my labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. But that doesn't mean I don't have room to grow and to develop. That doesn't mean that I don't have to rebuke myself to see whether I be in the faith, unless I be reprobate. But it means I bear with things. Or I never would have preached past a year. In fact, you have, you have a whole lot of encouragement not to preach. And I can tell you the greatest encourager not to preach, old Satan himself, through members of the church. They'll make you say, why can't I go out and get a job like everybody else and just work? Well, of course, that's his fancy because they got problems too. So what are we going to do about one another? Well, we ought to encourage one another in every way the New Testament says to be obedient to the truth. What all does that entail? It may entail where we're just simply encouraging people in the loss of a loved one or because of illness that bogs people down or because of troubles in a home or because of the loss of a job or because of whatever can come our way that comes everybody's way at one time or another. Or we can just slice the whole thing right off. Never give a reason to anything. I close by saying sometimes we just don't know what people really and genuinely from the heart are until they're put to the test. And then the genuineness of what they really are comes out. And that's what Paul said when he says there must be heretics among you. So that's the way things are declared as to who's on God's side and who's not. Remember when Moses dealing with those folks that rebelled at the foot of Sinai, made the statement, you're on the Lord's side, come over here. The rest of you stay over there. And those that stayed over there were swallowed up by an earthquake. I'm on the Lord's side, the old song says. Master, send me. So if you can't understand these things about evil that we talked about this morning, foul language, pornography, the evils of the world, how Satan puts those out to us, how we as members of the church in exercising the good influence should cut ourselves loose from those things, how we who are walking in straight and narrow and they're our brothers and sisters should bear with them and continue to show the truth without compromising, and yet as John says, my little children love one another, then maybe we need to do a lot more studying and praying because we really don't understand the Bible like we think we do. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, please believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in the Christ, and be baptized in the Christ for the remission of your sins. As a child of God, if you have wandered from whatever it may be that's enjoined upon you to be faithful as a child of God, repent of those things, come confessing them, and let's pray with you and for you that God will forgive us. 
I leave you with this as I can every sermon I preach. God wants you and me and everybody else to be saved. And he's made it possible for you to be saved. But you have to accept him on his own terms with the same mercy and love and grace that you want to extend to others that you expect him and beg of him to extend to you. If you're subject to the call, come while we stand and say.